Hello, everyone. International Master Keaton Kira here with you today. Welcome to my Chess.com series, High Level Entertainment. And today I want to show you a game that's a tribute to probably my greatest hero in chess, although I have many. But the Grandmaster, who was the greatest player of all time for so long before Carlson overtook his rating record, I'm talking about Garry Kasparov. And as I was growing up, Kasparov was everything in chess. He was, he was the greatest. He was the world champion. And there's something about Kasparov that I think he just instilled a fear in his opponents with his tenacity and his ability to calculate and find precise moves and play aggressive that I don't think anyone else really has. So even though on paper you can argue that Carlson is a better player, it's hard to imagine anyone that someone would fear playing more than Kasparov. And the game I'm going to show you today is certainly one of Kasparov's most incredible games. It's been called an immortal game. It's the game where he beat Grandmaster Veselin Topalov in 1999. So let's take a look at the game. Kasparov played white, and so he played e4. Topalov played the perk. So d4, knight f6, knight c3, g6. And Kasparov played a move that's one of many possible moves here, bishop e3. Black played bishop g7, and Kasparov played logically queen d2, preparing possibly the castle queen side and to have a battery with the queen and bishop. Black played c6, and now f3, which is a typical move, of course, in the Yugoslav attack in the dragon. Pawn to f3, defending e4 and keeping this knight out of g4, where it would pressure white's bishop. Black played b5, and knight g2, knight bd7, and bishop h6, trading off the bishop, so black takes... White takes with the queen, which of course is going to make it very difficult for black to castle kingside. So Topolov starts developing his queen side, bishop b7. White goes a3, preventing black from getting in b4. And now e5, taking space in the center, fighting for control of the center. Black castles queen side. And now queen e7. King b1, tucking the king away, making it safe. A6 looks like a strange move, but the idea is to defend the B-pawn, which will allow that C-pawn to come into action with C5. White goes knight C1, repositioning the knight, preparing to develop the bishop. And black also castles queenside. Makes it pretty hard for white to attack when the kings are castled the same way. Or at least so Topolov thought. Maybe he didn't realize he was playing Kasparov. So, knight to b3. e takes d4, and now rook takes d4, bringing the rook into the game. c5, as we mentioned, making that bishop powerful along the diagonal. Rook goes back to d1, knight b6. White plays g3, opening up this diagonal. Perhaps it'll be useful later on. King b8, tucking the king away from that diagonal. And now a nice move by white. Knight a5, settling into that kind of weak square on a5, also keeping an eye on the bishop and on this c6 square. Topolov had no interest in getting his bishop traded off. He goes bishop a8, and white played now bishop h3, developing the bishop to a nice square. d5, queen f4 check, king a7, and now Kasparov completes his development, bringing the rook into the center, and threatening to take on d5, to which Topolov responds d4. So here, white needs to find a continuation. He needs to find a plan. What do you think should be white's next move? If you're interested, you can pause your videos here and see if you can find a good continuation for white. So white needs to move his knight here, but where should he go? Should he play the more aggressive and risky knight d5? 
or maybe a more conservative move like knight e2 or knight a2. Obviously, it's much more in Kasparov's spirit to play knight d5, but knight d5 is not an easy move to play. It's a risky move, which really changes a lot of things in the position, and white needs to certainly do some calculation and understand the positions that are going to arise. From this moment, it appears that Kasparov calculated a sharp variation, a forcing variation, at least 15 moves deep. And what's so incredible about this game is Kasparov was finding puzzle-type moves 15 moves in advance in this position, which I believe he had to. Otherwise, if he didn't have those moves available, he would have been lost. So I guess one possibility, maybe Kasparov didn't see everything and he ended up getting lucky, but that's very hard to believe. So... Kasparov played knight to d5, black captured with the knight, e takes d5, attacking the queen, so queen goes to d6. Now, it looks like black is just going to trade queen, stabilize the position, and white's going to be in trouble because he's going to lose this pawn on d5. But look at this move. Rook takes d4. Kasparov had to know he had this move, otherwise he couldn't go into the variation. C takes d4, free rook. Rook e7 check. Very, very nice move. Now if the queen takes the rook, white can win with queen takes d4 check, king b8, queen b6 check, forcing black to block on b7. If he blocks with the queen, knight c6 is mate. If he blocks with the bishop, knight c6 check, king a8, queen a7 mate. So, the second rook sacrifice on e7 is uncapturable. So, black played king b6. Now, the forcing move, queen takes d4 check, after which king takes a5 is forced, b4 check, king a4, and now queen c3, threatening queen to b3 mate. Black has a couple of options to prevent queen b3. He can take on d5 with the queen or the bishop. If bishop takes d5, here white has a very nice idea that forces checkmate. If you'd like, you can pause the video and see if you can find it here. A really cool move for white, king b2, with the idea of queen b3 check, after which bishop takes b3 will be met by c takes b3, and black's king is checkmated by white's pawns. This idea would actually be unstoppable. After king b2, there's no way that black can prevent this checkmate. So he was forced to take on d5 with his queen, and now... Kasparov went rook a7, threatening to take the pawn on a6 with checkmate. Bishop b7, but now that's a free bishop. Rook takes b7, and of course black's queen can't recapture. Otherwise white will go queen b3 with checkmate. So white gets a little bit of material back, but he's still down a rook. White's only compensation is black's king, which is now nicely boxed in on a4, but still very hard to tell what's going on in this position. You can see what I was talking about when I said, when Kasparov played knight d5, he really needed to understand everything that was going on, because one thing leads to another. This is all very forced. So what's the truth about this position? Is white checkmating black? Does black have a winning position? Very hard to know unless you really calculate it and see everything, which is extraordinarily difficult to do. Black played queen c4 here. Queen takes f6, so white's making a comeback in the material. He's down only in exchange now, but black's king is released. King takes a3, which raises the question, 
who's checkmating whom. It looks like the Black King has gone rogue and become one of those conquering kings in the middle game, which we talked about in another video. Looks like maybe the Black King is helping Black checkmate White's king. Queen takes a3 check. King takes on b4. The Black King looks very safe, but now an only move, c3 check. It's not possible to take with the queen because white will be able to take on b5. So king takes c3. Now queen a1 check. King to d2. What's going on in this position? Black is up in exchange and a pawn. It's hard to tell whose king is more vulnerable. They're both quite open. Queen b2 check. King to d1, and here Kasparov finds two very study-like moves in a row. And I have to believe that he found these moves when he started this combination. Otherwise, he certainly wouldn't have thought this position would be good for white. But here he finds these amazing moves. If you'd like, you can pause your videos here, see if you can find them. So the first move is bishop f1, attacking the queen. The queen cannot take the bishop, otherwise white will go queen c2 check, forcing king e1, and then rook e7 will checkmate black's king. So the bishop cannot be captured. But Topolov now, with very nice counterplay, rook to d2, attacking white's queen. And if white trades everything off, then black should be in good shape in the rook ending. But Kasparov had to see this move. Rook to d7, an incredibly strong Maltesian cross kind of tactic, where he pins the rook from this side. Rook takes d7, and now the bishop is free to take the queen. And fortunately, when black takes back, White can go, queen takes h8, and 17 moves after he played knight d5 on move 22, initiating this whole combination, White now has a comfortably winning position, and the rest is technique. Still not overwhelmingly simple, as black has a passed pawn that White has to deal with, but the position now is winning with accurate play. Rook d3. Queen a8, c3, queen a4 check, kicking the king, and now f4, black played f5, waiting, simply king c1, blockading the pawn, and rook d2, but now after queen a7, black resigned, black's unable to capture this pawn because queen g1 check, winning the rook, and on the next move, White's just going to capture Black's pawn on h7 and start eating pawns, and the position's becoming pretty simple to win. So Black resigned. I hope you enjoyed Kasparov's Immortal game, and I think this game is a very good example of how great Kasparov was in calculation and why he was certainly the most feared player of his time and certainly the strongest player of that time as well.